All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining my talk today. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, Cloud Native vNext with uh, WebAssembly and Spin. Um, obviously, um, <laughs> I mean, the title is a little bit uh, catchy, um, but with WebAssembly and Spin, what we will see today is how we can, you know, uh, take several parts of a bigger or broader system and uh, use a different approach in contrast to, let's say, container technologies uh, and so on to run um, cloud native applications. So, um, yeah, we have 30 minutes, so quick introduction about myself. My name is Thorsten. I work with ThinkTecture here in Germany. Um, I mainly focus on cloud native. Uh, if it is public cloud, we use Azure um, because we have a strong background with .NET. Um, yeah, obviously, I do Kubernetes uh, almost daily and also yeah, Docker. I mean, that's like the basement, right? Um, so most important thing over here is obviously the mail address or the Twitter handle. If you have any question, don't hesitate, just ask. Um, and with that, let's jump right into um, the topic. So first, let's do uh, oh, let's revisit some essential or important terms um, in order to, you know, dive into using WebAssembly and if I say using WebAssembly today, I don't mean using WebAssembly in the browser. So this talk only focuses on uh, WebAssembly on the server side, in the cloud, in the private data center, or on your bare metal. So uh, we have several yeah, terms or technologies or specifications that um, are important to understand uh, when it comes to using uh, WebAssembly to build actual workloads. So what is WebAssembly? I mean, WebAssembly is a virtual machine that, um, or that, um, that takes instructions in a stack and processes them, right? So um, all those instructions are in binary format. And the most important thing for us as developers, it's just a compiler target, right? So we can use, I would not say every language or any language, but almost any language um, that is able to compile to WebAssembly as the target platform. So the overall landscape keeps on increasing and more and more languages are adopting or bringing support for WebAssembly. Um, one of the most prominent languages when it comes to building WebAssembly uh, or yeah, building applications with WebAssembly is Rust. Um, Go has currently, uh, we use Tiny Go in order to compile to WASM32.net. Um, so C Sharp, F Sharp, and all those languages, they have experimental support for WebAssembly 2. So we will see, uh, or we, we will be able in the future to compile .NET applications also to uh, WebAssembly. So why is WebAssembly so interesting on the server side? So first of all, it's incredibly fast, it's uh, secure, it's secure by default, and we will see um, what, uh, what brings the safety to, um, to the surface, right, in a second. And portable, we can take a WebAssembly module and run it on any kind of operating system. So um, the WebAssembly system interface that's the, the interesting thing, because that gives us that agnost agnosticity, right? Um, you can think of it as an abstraction layer on top of all the APIs and all the things that operating systems provide. Um, so it's a layer of uh, standardiz standardization, let's say it that way. So for example, if your intention is to load a file or to open a file, a uh, WebAssembly system interface is providing those APIs and responsible for talking with the underlying operating system APIs. So we don't have to compile um, for a certain uh, platform. We just compile to WASM32 WASI. That's how the platform is called. And our code is able to be executed on any operating system. So there was I think Java was it back in 2001 uh, when they came up with the promise write once, run everywhere. And with WebAssembly, we can actually do that. And we can also leverage you know, the browser as another platform over here. Um, 
Speaking about security or safety, how, how I have called it in the, in the previous slides, um, traditionally um, we have something that's called the user mode on an on a operating system, right? That is where all our applications will be executed. And there are some uh, disadvantages of this traditional model, how applications or how operating systems work. So for example, um, we have a, a regular application, right, that wants to read files from a certain folder and everything that happens on the uh, operating system level is it's checked if the user who executes that application has the permission to read or write files in that particular um, directory, let's say that way. However, this is uh, a huge risk because if you get a, an, an evil app or risky app, how it's called in the uh, in the picture over here, uh, that is that could you know use my privileges to read. In this case, it reads a wallet and it sends the contents of the wallet by issuing an, an TCP connection to a remote server. Right, so everything the operating system is able to check is if the user who executes that application has the permission to do so. So on a regular machine, you know, uh, my username is Torsten here on my Mac. I am able to read files on in most of the folders and I'm able to issue outbound network connectivities. So I could, it, it is a vector for me personally, if I start a risky app. And with WebAssembly system interface, uh, we can provide or uh, decorate applications with permissions. So we can, so we have two factors, right? Like for example, if you do web application development or if you build APIs, you probably have heard of OAuth 2. Um, so it's quite similar, right? We have not just the user uh, that we can take into consideration for granting permissions, we can also grant permissions to apps right now with WebAssembly. And that's one of the reasons why we think that WebAssembly has a bright future and maybe in a couple of years perhaps become the standard way how we distribute or to which platform we compile our applications. Okay, last uh, term before we jump right into spin is WebAssembly Gateway Interface. Um, perhaps some of you have heard of CGI or remember CGI, let's say it that way. Uh, it's like 25 years old and it was so, um, the first, let's say, way how we can build HTTP-based applications on the server side. So, for example, you know, if you uh, want to create a response, then you write um, the headers to environment variables and you can just, uh, the, con the body of the response, just uh, you write that just to standard out. So the WebAssembly Gateway interface defines all the things you know when it comes to building HTTP-based applications. So that's the quick introduction into the WebAssembly ecosystem, let's say it that way. Um, but we are here for Fermion Spin. So Fermion is, a, I would not say startup, it's an organization or a, a company that drives WebAssembly adoption, especially on the server side. Um, most of the employees and founders of Fermion were previously working at Microsoft and are well-known people in the cloud native space. So they are the founders of Helm and CNAP and so on and so forth. They all, um, they built or started Fermion in 2020, early 2022. And they came up with a framework slash CLI slash uh, runtime that's called Spin. So Spin allows us to write, let's say, um, applications or um, yeah, cloud native applications, let's say that way, or microservices in a real efficient way. So they have currently SDKs uh, for several languages. I've mentioned them on the slides, so Rust, TinyGo, and so on and so forth. However, you can build these kinds of applications with any programming language, again, that is able to compile towards WASM32 WASI, so to the WebAssembly platform. 
They leverage the WebAssembly component model, which is a quite new specification, you know, that uh, defines how different WebAssembly modules interact with each other or how you can embed those into uh, bigger modules. So that's used under the covers, right? Um, it's the runtime because spin takes all our, let's say, WebAssembly modules and uh, in instantiates them if a request, you know, is sent to uh, the desired endpoint. And uh, we can have different, let's say, triggers. So, for example, we have HTTP. We can invoke our module if a message is um, appears in a Redis cache. And um, currently, they or they recently released uh, Postgres, Postgres bindings and stuff like that. So it's ac under active development. Let's say it that way. And it is a CLI. So it is a CLI that we as developers can use to build applications. Um, uh, to build spin applications. And with that, let's move right into um, the terminal first. So I have installed spin on my machine. So I can use that CLI, right? The spin comes with a set of templates. Um, they are managed or maintained in a dedicated Git repository. So once you've installed spin, you have to download the templates first, and then you can you know, build applications using different languages, using different triggers, let's say it that way again. And yeah, you can get started in seconds. So for example, let's say spin new HTTP. We use Rust right now to build a Hello World example. We call it Hello, oops, Hello Code Talks. We want our WebAssembly module or our component to be instantiated if a request hits the URL Hello on the root. Okay, what we get right now is a Hello World project, a project so they spin up or they uh, use the skeleton to create a, a regular Rust application. It's not a binary, it's a library, right? So we see that uh, with the lib.rs uh, file. Um, and they, you know, they include their um, SDK as a dependency and several other dependencies that make sense to use when building asynchronous um, Rust applications. So the center of gravity for every spin application is the spin.toml. That's where everything comes together, right? So as you can see, we specify a component and the component points to uh, the location where our compiled code later will resist. And yeah, the trigger that we con the route that we configured previously using the CLI. Behind the scenes, um, that's the interesting thing, they don't do any magic uh, with your Rust code or with your Go code. Um, they just invoke the, f the regular command to build the application. In our case, they use Cargo, so that's the package manager and tooling infrastructure for Rust um, to build the application for WASM32 WASI for that platform and in a release mode to optimize it for performance reasons, right? All right, so let's take a look at how a component that uh, responds to an incoming HTTP call looks like. So we have the, um, the spin SDK over here that brings you know, an HTTP API that we can use to, to interact with, with the response on an request model, uh, request response model that way. So there's hello fermion, let's change that to hello code. Oops, talks. And let's set another HTTP header, let's say x dash confer conference location and let's set that one to Hamburg. Hamburg. There we go. So moving back to the terminal, we can go into that folder, let's say hello world, and let's say spin build and yeah, let's build it first. It takes a time because Rust, you know, builds all the dependencies so locally right now. Build time will increase once we have built all the dependencies, obviously. All right, there we go. And once we have compiled our application, we can use uh, spin 
up or we can use spin build dash dash up as you saw it in the in the um, in the terminal earlier. Okay, that's it. So we have an HTTP endpoint right now. And we can go over here and can curl this this one. Let's call hello, hello. And we get back HTTP 200 with our um, our header being set and uh, the response we specified. That's cool. The cool thing is how fast it is because WebAssembly is fast compared to a Docker container. Obviously, I mean, let's uh, take a look at our hello world. Um, then we have target, WASM32 Buzzy, and we have the release. And as you can see, our the entire application with all its dependencies is two megabytes in size, right? And so spin, what the, the framework or the runtime actually does for every incoming HTTP request in this case, it instantiates a new instance of the WebAssembly module, meaning we have no shared state between uh, the HTTP requests and we have a clean, you know, let's say surface for every request. And it's incredibly fast and it scales very well. So let's invoke 50,000 times that endpoint. And I think it takes a couple of seconds to finish. Yep, there we go, 50,000 requests, all responded with HTTP 200. Obviously, there is no logic right now happening, right? We have new, no user code in our handler. However, um, it runs on my local machine. It spins up new WebAssembly module instances for every request, and it still maintains you know, a response time of uh, three milliseconds, right? So it's really fast and it scales amazingly. However, um, I mean, yeah, HTTP GET is not the real world scenario. So let's uh, jump into another uh, example. Let's take a look at the watch. Okay, 30 minutes, that looks good. Let's kill this one and let's go to the this terminal. And we have the message publisher over here. It's also a REST, um, uh, Rust, <laughs> a ru a Rust uh, project. Um, however, it is right now configured, um, there's the spin tommel, um, to respond to messages or to publish messages into uh, a Redis cluster. So the Redis cluster is running on my local machine or the Redis is a single container instance, right? Uh, it's running on my local machine and I specify a message or a channel that I want the message to be published to. And I want to expose or to interact or to trigger my component again using HTTP. But this time we want an HTTP POST request. So let's go into our lib. So let's uh, get rid of this one. Font size is okay for you in the upper row. Okay, cool. Um, so first we can uh, use the SDK to interact with the request um, to check for the method, right? So we can say if request dot method um, not equals HTTP, then we have a request, we have the um, HTTP, sorry, method, that was wrong, method post. So if it is not a post, then we want to, yeah, that looks almost good. Some method not allowed into this. And there we go. There are question mark. And that's good. All right. So if, you know, an other HTTP method is used as post, then we want to, um, yeah, to respond with a 405 in that case. I have a snippet, I guess. No, I don't have a snippet. Why I don't have a snippet? I have a snippet. Give me a second. 30 minutes is not a lot. So we use the um, P. So let's use this one over here. There we go. Mm -hmm. No, that's wrong. This one, sorry. 
All right. Uh, so get rid of that and let's first use. Oh, come on. In, in that time, I would have written everything, obviously. <laughs> so we use um, regular um, Rust standard library to read the environment or the configuration we specified in uh, spin.toml. So they are injected at runtime as environment variables, and we can pick them up and use them in our code to process. Uh, so let's build the payload. That's also easy. And last but not least, let's um, publish the message to Redis. So again, Redis over here comes from the spin SDK. So this one, you know, exposes HTTP, Redis and PostgreSQL currently. Um, and we can use that to publish a pay payload in our case, which is just the content of the request that we issue via HTTP. And we publish that to a certain channel in our Redis container. And if that's successful, so then the OK branch will be executed over here. Uh, then we respond with an HTTP 200. If it's not successful, if something bad happens, right, then uh, we respond with an HTTP 500. All right, let's give that a try. So let's say um, spin build dash dash up. Oops. Uh, HTTP, the one line I've written manually, right? Ah, come on. Demo, check HTTP method, let's do it that way. So, all right, so it's building and there we go. So we can now take curl again and issue post request and we get back an HTTP 200 because I have running my Redis already in Docker. So we have um, so we have the publisher and let's trust it right now that it sends a message into our Redis, uh, pops up, uh, is used in that case. Um, so we want to build some consumers, right? So we can say spin uh, new and we want Redis go. And let's say a uh, consumer message consumer in Golang. Um, Redis address, let's take this one. Redis channel was code talks. There we go. And we see how we can use the spin SDK in. Golang, they are. This is using Tiny Go, so it's not the regular Go um, platform right now because you know there's uh, there's history when it comes to Go and and WebAssembly, but Tiny Go uh, is able to compile to WASM32 Vasi, so we can use all the APIs that uh, Tiny Go supports from the standard library uh, to take or to build our applications. And for now, let's just, you know, take the uh, message that is sent to Redis and write it to the uh, to, to standard out. And as you can see, so we have to use the init method to register our handler and the main method that's just a main function and there's a typo in the template. Uh, the main function must stay in your source code in order to, you know, make the Go compiler happy. All right, again, uh, we go into the message consumer go and we use our regular tooling spin build dash dash up. <coughs> so it's building the Go application uh, for the VESM32 VASI platform. And there we go. So we can again issue an HTTP request curl we get back an HTTP 200. However, we don't see anything over here because uh, spin by default um, takes the standard out and standard error and forwards it to a file. So we can use the fourth terminal over here to cut the F to um, dot spin. Then there is a message consumer go was it called and there is logs and there is standard out and error. 
Oops. Uh, illegal option. What? Ah, it's tail. Yeah. Sorry. There we go. So we have a couple of messages over here. We have uh, five messages appeared there. Okay, thank you. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we should see right now that there uh, our messages will be processed uh, by uh, the spin application written in Go. Last but not least, we can do another one. Because it's pub sub, right, we can have multiple subscribers. So we can say spin a new Redis dash rust and let's call that one message consumer message consumer in rust again and this looks all good uh, channel is code talks again and let's go to message consumer and let's say um, spin build dash dash up but let's previous before let's set um, export rust log trace so that we can actually get some output about what happens uh, under the covers so let's say spin build dash dash up again all dependencies must be built for the first time on my local machine so it can take a couple of seconds right now to build them come on waiting for the compiler, something that the Go developer doesn't know, right? Um, come on. There we go. So we see a couple of traces over here, so that the uh, component or which module it ta uh, has taken for, um, for that application and that the context is initialized, but let's again invoke a method and then at least we get back request finished with OK and we also see OK where, are, where is standard out redirected to and if we take a look at this uh, text file right now uh, then we will see would see the same message so we can easily you know create uh, multiple workers for um, messages appearing in a pub sub architecture um, using spin and the cool thing is although it comes with uh, those templates for those languages um, that we've seen over here spin templates list um, you can use as I said any language that supports um, WASM32 WASI as a platform so uh, there's a kitchen sink repository provided by Fermion where you can find samples in C sharp and other languages um, to see how you can you know adopt that style of building applications uh, with spin uh, three minutes left. Wow. And with that, let me quickly, there's obviously another um, another uh, part of the story. It's not just building those applications because one of the most interesting questions is where do I run those, um, those applications in, let's say, production, right? So there's Fermion platform and although the name sounds like they are building their own SaaS offering, which could be a thing, um, I don't know, um, but Fermion platform is a combination of, let's say, infrastructure software, it's like they use Nomen as a cluster for um, for running um, the infrastructure or running uh, the runtime, right? Um, they use Consul to do service discovery, so well-known tools and uh, products that you see in that list. What they use to actually build the infrastructure that we as developers can leverage for running our spin applications on. And the cool thing is you can install those uh, the platform on every or in every public cloud in your private data center or even on your local developer machine so on bare metal that's supported for all those environments they have also an installer repository uh, where you can find uh, terraform projects for all the different environments that you can just you know configure according to your needs and then uh, get everything up and running in minutes so this is um, how you can um, you know, build a production grade runtime to run your spin applications. And again, you use the spin CLI. So there is a spin deploy subcommand that you can use to uh, deploy your applications onto a Fermion platform wherever it runs. 
Um, interesting thing is also Bindel. Um, Bindel is also or has been written by the folks that right now work at Fermion. So that's used as a distribution channel, let's say that way. So there uh, your spin applications will be stored in Bindel and then the runtime will you know, take the WebAssembly modules from there, the instructions from there and uh, run the application.